Doru Kostake, C-H pronounced K in Romanian. Awesome. Doru Kostake is ISCAST's new uh, research director, and he has certainly hit the ground running. I won't give you all the details except to say that we have a grant application going in in the next in the next few days. So Doru has been working with his cast for about three weeks and uh, one of his first jobs has been putting in a grant application to uh, to rejuvenate, to revive the ISCAST journal, uh, Christian Perspectives on Science and Technology. So we, we do hope that we can get some funding to do that. Doru is Romanian. He's an Orthodox theologian. He's an Orthodox with a capital O, as well as a small O. He's, uh, he's written a lot in the science and faith field. His PhD was on cosmology and the early Christian fathers, particularly Maximus the Confessor. And it is a great privilege and pleasure to have Doru uh, on staff two days a week at the moment uh, with ISCAST. And while we're here, uh, why don't I introduce you, if you don't know the other ISCAST staff, Sarah, why don't you wave your hand? Where I'm just looking for Sarah. Is Sarah still the, there? Sarah's, Sarah's hidden her face. Um, Sarah's, Sarah's the program director. There she is in her uh, big blue jumper with the, uh, with the appropriate almost green screen behind her. Uh, Jackie Liu. Jackie, wave your hand. Uh, Jackie is the digital communication specialist at ISCAST and doing a great job of helping us all to think about uh, how we uh, look good on paper, even though it's not paper anymore, it's digital, how we look good on Facebook and all that sort of thing. Uh, and Dave, Dave Hooker is also here, who I was threatening with uh, giving an impromptu talk a few minutes ago. Uh, not keen. Dave is our publications director, also two days a week, and uh, working on the publication side of things. Uh, and obviously, I mentioned the journal before. Uh, Dave and Doru will be working together on, on the journal. So, Doru, I won't waste any more time. I'll hand over to you. I'll remind people that we are recording, that there will be a time for questions afterwards. If you'd like to ask questions, what we, what we can do is we can do two things. We can sort of ask questions and have that as a verbal conversation, but we can also have a conversation going in the chat. You can make comments in the chat. Other people will read it. Other people will comment, although we may not uh, verbally discuss everything that's going on in the chat, but don't let that stop you. Please use the chat to uh, make comments. After, the, after tonight's session, probably tomorrow sometime, uh, the recording will go up on YouTube and the link will appear on the conversations website. Doru, over to you. We're in your hands for half an hour or so. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a great honor to be a, a member of uh, ISCAST um, and uh, to meet uh, so many beautiful, wonderful people. Uh, my presentation uh, Tonight, oh, I can't share it because the host has decide, disabled screen sharing. Okay. I've made you a co-host, so you should be able to share now, Doro. Wow, I'm uh, so overwhelmed. Um, here it is. Um, of course, my, my topic uh, isn't uh, uh, along the lines uh, with what we have heard in the uh, last few weeks. Um, although I um, um, conceive it as a methodological approach to the topic of uh, creationism and uh, evolutionism, um, upon uh, Chris's suggestion, uh, I uh, included some theology there and not only in the title. So. To cut it short, my topic, two questions and uh, the attempt of an answer. Are Christians creationists? Must scientists be evolutionists? A methodological and theological answer. Now, the outlines of my um, uh, short talk tonight are as follows. Uh, a challenge, 
which is pretty, pretty much uh, the abstract of, uh, of my talk. Uh, a background to this talk uh, showing you on what materials the is being recorded. Oh, okay. Uh, on, on what materials uh, is my talk uh, uh, based? Uh, then uh, an early Christian example of uh, uh, approaching uh, the scientific culture of the time from a theological viewpoint. Uh, and um, uh, some methodological distinctions, which uh, represent um, uh, the bulk of, uh, of my talk tonight, and uh, some theological examples or exemplifications of uh, why I believe that uh, neither uh, Christians uh, should call themselves, uh, themselves creationists, nor scientists should stick to the evolutionist paradigm. Um, the challenge, as I said uh, just briefly, is uh, uh, the abstract of, uh, of my paper. And for those of you who uh, haven't um, uh, looked at the abstract before, um, it's the idea of uh, uh, doubting the propriety of considering um, creationism and evolutionism the only way in which uh, the relationship between scientists and Christians, theologians or otherwise uh, can unfold. Uh, I do believe that uh, we should uh, draw a line between description and interpretation when we talk about uh, science and theology. Science, from my viewpoint, perhaps simplistic, but from my viewpoint, science uh, is a descriptive approach or entails a descriptive approach to reality. It's analytical, uh, whereas theology cannot make such a claim. Theology is an interpretive approach to reality, to whatever objects we might consider. Um, so it is on, on this uh, basic distinction between description and interpretation that I'll try to build my case, um, pointing out the fact that the theory of evolution, which is uh, a scientific description of reality, uh, is not the same uh, with evolutionism, which is an ideological interpretation of the facts. Um, it's, it goes the same uh, for um, uh, the Christian doctrine of creation, uh, which is a uh, theological uh, interpretation of the facts, not a description, whereas creationism attempts to provide us with a uh, description of the facts, at least uh, after a fashion. Um, I believe that we have a problem here. Uh, creationism uh, pretends to be able to describe reality. Uh, evolutionism pretends to be able to uh, interpret uh, reality. And uh, uh, I believe that this is uh, an anomaly, methodologically speaking. And this is why we need uh, a number of distinctions to make sense of uh, how things uh, might look like uh, from a more normal viewpoint, at least the way I conceive this viewpoint. Um, let's uh, proceed. Uh, a background to this talk. Uh, these are um, some of my recent publications having to do with uh, the topic of uh, uh, science and theology. Uh, all of them published in the last couple of years. Um, the one on top there uh, in a, uh, an edited volume uh, at Brepols published uh, last year. Uh, it's about a uh, Romanian theologian, modern Romanian theologian who uh, managed to address matters of uh, contemporary cosmology and physics from the viewpoint of a very traditional worldview. Uh, and it, uh, it resulted a very successful um, synthesis, if you like, of uh, um, scientific Christian worldview, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, these are just um, uh, to show you that uh, my talk tonight is based on uh, serious uh, research. Uh, most of these um, uh, papers are uh, published in uh, prestigious um, uh, publications, uh, 
big publishers, first year, um, and um, so on and so forth. And this is my most recent baby, uh, uh, a book that uh, is about to be published uh, by Brill, uh, Humankind and the Cosmos, Early Christian Representations, which sort of brings together uh, most of the topics that I'll be discussing tonight. Now, let's move to um, that uh, Christian exemplification I uh, mentioned earlier. Um, it's just one case, but very typical for um, early Christianity, for early Christian theology, uh, a time when uh, theologians were also philosophers, philosophers were also scientists, uh, and therefore everyone was able to know uh, a lot uh, of stuff about uh, each other's um, uh, perspectives, contributions, and so on and so forth. Uh, no wonder that this man who um, uh, received the best of trainings available at the time in the fourth century in Athens, um, after a uh, uh, short but uh, uh, quite uh, uh, exemplar um, career uh, as a philosopher, uh, embraced Christian ministry and uh, as a bishop, uh, put to a great use his uh, uh, previously acquired knowledge, including scientific, not only philosophical, uh, in order to uh, preach uh, the gospel, uh, to preach the Christian faith in ways that uh, were intelligible for the audiences of that time. Now, I have two exemplifications from Basil's famous homilies on uh, the Exaimeron, uh, the six uh, days of creation. So he composed this series of, uh, of homilies. Uh, of course, uh, there's a difference between what he uh, delivered orally in, in, uh, in church to live audiences and the version uh, that uh, uh, exists to this day and it's uh, at our disposal, the written version. Uh, what matters? Uh, is what he says. And I'll I won't be giving you too much background uh, in relation to, to, to his thinking, uh, but these two exemplifications, I hope, uh, will uh, illustrate the very encompassing mind of this, this man. Here's the first um, passage uh, from the second homily, uh, paragraph three. Uh, it's the same uh, place where I uh, also got the next uh, quotation on the next slide. So uh, he speaks of Moses as the author of Genesis. We don't discuss now whether Moses was or not the author of Genesis. Traditionally, Moses uh, is uh, the author of Genesis. When he, Moses that is said, in the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. He passed over in silence many things such as water, air and fire out of which the created things or created beings happen to be produced. All these elements, which complete the cosmos, clearly existed without any doubt, but the story left them out so that our mind can exercise its skills by inferring the rest from little pointers. Well, uh, this is uh, typical for uh, Basil of Caesarea and many other early Christian theologians. They never took Genesis or any other part of the scriptures as a scientific textbook. Uh, they believe that uh, the scriptures are um, uh, uh, presenting us with wisdom lessons, uh, with the theological perspective on things, and it is our duty to uh, fill the gaps, so to speak, in the narrative, with uh, whatever available science uh, is at our disposal, uh, regardless of where or when we live. Uh, in this case, uh, he made reference to the doctrine of uh, four elements from the classical Greek um, uh, physics. Although here he mentions only three of them, water, air, and fire. By the way, elements that are only uh, uh, partially present in Genesis 1, the element water, but air and fire aren't mentioned. But he says, well, we need to fill the gaps in the narrative and uh, bring in whatever we know um, 
whatever is available to us today in order to uh, complete the image uh, of, uh, of creation. In other words, if we want to draw the map of the cosmos, we will need to um, uh, bring in scientific information um, against the backdrop of this theological uh, pers uh, perspective on things that Moses, Genesis uh, provides us with. Uh, the next uh, passage, uh, again, from the same homily, just a few lines later, uh, uh, quite a different topic. Due to the latent potentiality stored in it by the creator, matter was in painful labor with the generation of all things, waiting for the auspicious times when by a divine call, it would bring out into the open the things engendered within it. Uh, what's this about? Um, of course, a very uh, philosophical vocabulary uh, here. Uh, things uh, are in a chaotic state uh, and uh, there's this kind of pulsation within matter, within the stuff of the universe, uh, uh, waiting for the opportune uh, moment in order to uh, become uh, specified, to become beings. But uh, this uh, maternal labor of matter uh, needs some uh, assistance, needs a nudge, needs a boost, you know, some adrenaline boost, if you like. Uh, and that's um, the divine call, the divine commandment, let it be whatever, you know. Uh, this is, again, typic uh, typical for Basil and other early Christian theologians. Uh, and uh, I have selected this one because it illustrates uh, a convergence of natural potentiality or natural power, natural, uh, natural energy and divine energy. There's no break between uh, God and, and the universe. Uh, God doesn't suspend the order of nature in order to do things. God uh, gives nudges from within the stuff of, uh, of the universe uh, to this maternal uh, capacity in order to create the world. So what did we learn from these two passages? Uh, Genesis is not a scientific textbook. The gaps in its theological narrative must be filled by scientific information. Uh, and it is a theological narrative because it focuses on God, not on the world. God said, God did, God saw, God named. Uh, we know from uh, Genesis. What else uh, have we learned? Uh, that what facilitates the generation of beings in the universe is a fundamental ongoing interaction of the divine and the cosmic energies. And I have pl plenty more passages to show you, but there's no time for it, where Basil actually shows uh, in a number of instances how um, uh, this uh, uh, case of uh, uh, interaction, creative interaction between natural and supernatural, let's call them energies, uh, is an ongoing uh, reality. It's not something that happens only from time to time. The, the true nature of nature, so to speak, is that it is uh, permeated by the divine presence, by uh, God's active presence. Back to the challenge. What do we read behind Basil's understanding of scripture and science? I uh, believe that uh, uh, behind the story or his narrative are some methodological distinctions. One of them, the most important from my viewpoint, is between description and interpretation. Uh, and there's also a question that we should ask. What made him construe creation as an ongoing synergetic event or as ongoing synergetic events? Uh, and I believe that the answer is that for him, there's no separation between natural and supernatural. In other words, uh, we deal here with the thinker uh, coming from uh, the eastern side of the Mediterranean uh, uh, basin, not from the west. Uh, and uh, for the mind of this man, there's no break between uh, natural and supernatural. Uh, we know that uh, like 50 years or so after Basil's time, um, when uh, Augustine flourished uh, in, in the west, uh, there was that uh, terrible conflict between Augustine and Pelagius uh, about nature and grace, natural and supernatural. 
uh, and it was uh, a matter of either or. In Basil's case, there's no either or. Both nature and the supernatural work together in conjunction. Now, moving to the methodological distinctions, uh, science, uh, from my viewpoint, is a description of things and processes. You might laugh, you might smile, uh, but that's me. For, for, for my purposes, uh, this is the simplest, the most basic um, definition of science, a description of things and processes. And from my viewpoint, evolution is not the same with evolutionism. Evolution is a description of things and processes. Yeah? The theory of evolution, I mean. That's, uh, by definition, a scientific approach to reality. What's evolutionism then? Evolutionism is a naturalist ideological interpretation of how things happen. And the emphasis is on only, only natural energies are at work. There's no room for the supernatural. Yeah. So from my viewpoint, evolution or the theory of evolution uh, is a scientific way of looking at things, not an ideology. Evolutionism, however, is a very different beast and has nothing to do with any science altogether. The doctrine of creation. The doctrine of creation is a theological interpretation of reality. It's not a description. Uh, its uh, emphasis is on God, on the creator. Who did this? That's the question in the doctrine of creation. Who did all this? And God said, and God did, and God saw, and God put names to whatever he created. From my viewpoint, creation, the doctrine of creation and creationism aren't the same. Creation, or the doctrine of creation rather, is a scripturally faith-based theological interpretation of reality. It shows what created things are in relation to God. In turn, creationism is a supernaturalist ideological description of what happens and how it happens, with the emphasis on only God works. You know, all the discontinuities that we know from various uh, creationist narratives, uh, um, the material of the universe is passive, only God uh, moves things, God, uh, God does things, and there's no natural input to speak of. Anyway, from my viewpoint, the doctrine of creation is typical for uh, a theological view of reality, uh, whereas creationism has nothing to do with the doctrine of creation. So we have two anomalies in front of our eyes, evolutionism and cre uh, creationism. Evolutionism is a, an ideological naturalist interpretation that pretends to be a descriptive science. Creationism, on the other hand, is an ideological supernaturalist interpretation that pretends to be a descriptive science. Yeah? How God does things, that's a scientific description of things. Can we bridge creationism and evolutionism? The answer obviously is negative. Uh, they are methodological anomalies that originate in the separation between natural and supernatural, which uh, I have to say it uh, is uh, intrinsically Western. It isn't known to Eastern uh, Christians, at, at least not traditionally. So, we have two different viewpoints on reality. The theory of evolution is a scientific description of reality, how things uh, are, what they are, how they function and so on and so forth. Whereas the doctrine of creation is a theological interpretation of reality. Can we bridge creation and evolution? And my answer is yes. They are two different methodologies, two different viewpoints, uh, which account for very different dimensions of reality. There's no way in which uh, you can validate or invalidate something, uh, a theological statement uh, from any scientific viewpoint and vice versa. There's no way in which any uh, theology can validate or invalidate science. Can we bridge them? How? Uh, by acknowledging their complementarity. They complement one another. 
But do we really need to bridge theology and science, uh, the theory of evolution and the doctrine of creation? I believe that if we want a comprehensive map of reality, yes, we do. Yes, we need. Uh, but is this bridge possible? I believe it is, but only if we forget about the cultural separation between uh, natural and supernatural. Remember Sam Basil's example. How uh, can that be? Uh, by replacing the either or approach, either natural or supernatural, by the principle of synergy. Remember the pangs of labor, of matter, uh, and the divine nudge, the divine call, the divine energy. Uh, they go hand in hand, not superseding one another or excluding one another. And by the way, if you are interested, uh, you can read this uh, amazing uh, book edited by uh, Martin Nowak and Sarah Coakley in 2013, uh, Evolution, Games and God, The Principle of Cooperation. Uh, uh, if you haven't uh, gotten this one, uh, it's a must, trust me. Uh, moving from physics and cosmology to biology, anthropology, ethics, you name it. It's an amazing book, very useful. Uh, it's, uh, well, cooperation, synergy, it's the same, yeah? Now, uh, moving to some, um, uh, some theological examples as promised. I believe that uh, my proposal, namely that uh, we could reconcile uh, uh, theology and science, evolution and creation on methodological grounds um, is a uh, distinct possibility uh, if we uh, consider uh, in all seriousness uh, basic Christian doctrines. For instance, my examples are uh, the Trinitarian doctrine and the Christological doctrine. Uh, simply put, uh, how can we uh, describe uh, God's input into the world, God's activity in the world? We know that uh, uh, there's a paradoxical uh, aspect to the divine existence. On the one hand, uh, there are the three entities or persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. On the other hand, there's the unity uh, of uh, uh, of these three uh, uh, persons, these three entities, uh, to the extent that uh, uh, we had to invent more recently uh, in the Christian uh, 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 jargon, uh, a word such as triunity. Yeah? Triunity is a, is a, is a modern world, a word uh, which uh, gives account for this paradoxical structure of God, uh, Trinity and unity. Well, uh, the three personal, uh, the three persons have their own input, the, their own uh, kind of activity, and we can identify something that is uh, the initiative of the Father, the um, uh, actualization of a certain um, um, a divine plan uh, by the Son, uh, and the cooperation of the Spirit, and so on and so forth. But uh, at least early Christian theologians uh, were always careful to. Uh, affirm the fact that although we can distinguish their different mark of the three persons, uh, in the world, their activity is indistinct. They all cooperate in anything that we consider divine activity. Everything happens, said Athanasius of Alexandria, um, just a few years before Basil's death, uh, so the fourth century said everything that God does is from the Father through the Son in the Spirit. Yeah? We distinguish uh, the, uh, the imprint, the mark of uh, each person, but uh, in reality, uh, there's one activity of God uh, that we can experience and contemplate in the, uh, in the world. In other words, we have a case of um, converging differences. Yeah? You would say, well, what has this to do with science and, and theology? Well, science and theology are two different approaches to reality, isn't it? Uh, the way, um, or, or put otherwise, um, uh, natural energies and supernatural energies are very different uh, factors or agents at work in the universe. Still, they cooperate. 
Yeah. So uh, the Trinitarian doctrine actually uh, serves us very well. Uh, Convergent differences. Moving to the uh, Christological doctrine, we have the person of Christ, uh, divine human, uh, and its two components, uh, divine and human. Yeah. Um, there are two energies within Christ's person. There's a divine energy and there's a human energy, but uh, we never, uh, we, we can never distinguish what's divine and what's human in what Christ does. Because for instance, uh, when he eats uh, or drinks something, he does that as a person that is God incarnate, divine human. In other words, another paradoxical approach, if you like, to, to the mystery of God, uh, God drinks and eats. And as St. Peter says in, I think it's the second letter, uh, the second uh, of the Catholic letters, uh, he says something like, uh, God died in the flesh. Yeah? It's not the real death of God, ontologically speaking, but uh, it's a way for God in Christ to experience what does that mean to die. Yeah? And it's, it's the same with... Um, uh, uh, with the activities of, uh, of Christ's human side. Um, they are imbued by, by the divine. Uh, and the divine activities of Christ are imbued by, by the human. Uh, uh, as uh, some um, uh, medieval theologians um, uh, said, uh, everything that Christ does or uh, what we see in Christ's activity is uh, God doing in a human way whatever things and the human being doing in a divine way whatever things um, so we have uh, uh, these two um, uh, energies or activities divine and human uh, which again converge in christ in one divine human activity but i, I think uh, i'll stop here with uh, with my theological incursions uh, i just wanted to exemplify uh, with these two basic doctrines, we all share in the fact that uh, we are supposed to think in terms of uh, complementarity and integration of, uh, of differences rather than in either or terms. Yeah? Christ is the typical example uh, that shows why we, we shouldn't go for the natural versus supernatural paradigm. Now, uh, the seemingly... Uh, irreconcilable uh, elements yeah, uh, are not actually irreconcilable. Can this framework be applied to science and faith, evolution and creation? I believe that yes, it can. But again, only if we abandon the separation between natural and supernatural. Now, back to my questions, and that's the end of my talk for tonight. Um, are Christians necessarily creationists? Must scientists be evolutionists? At least in the light of my methodological distinctions and in the light of um, um, the basic Christian doctrines mentioned earlier, uh, no. Uh, Christians can believe whatever they want. They can even be creationists, but that doesn't mean that all Christians should be creationists. Also, some scientists, of course, uh, they can be evolutionists, they can be atheists, they can be agnostic, they can be whatever they want. Some of them are Buddhist, some of them are Muslim. Yeah? They can believe in whatever they, 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 uh, they want. But it doesn't mean that that's science. Yeah? And therefore, they, they shouldn't consider science uh, as uh, equal to uh, any ideology uh, that they might embrace, including evolutionism. So, um, no, Christians shouldn't be uh, creationists, not necessarily, and scientists shouldn't be evolutionists, not necessarily. Um, and now that this hurdle <laughs> is out of the way, I believe that we all must rethink our position in regard to one another. That's an open question and challenge. And this is where I end my presentation for tonight. Well, thank you, Doru. You end your presentation by throwing this hand grenade into the midst of Christendom. 
That's great. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, let me remind everybody how we're going to how we're going to run this. Uh, if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you will find a button that says reactions. And the big reaction on the bottom of that little window that pops up is raise hand. So I've just raised my hand. Um, I can't even see myself, but I think I've got my hand up somewhere. Yes, yes, you uh, have. Yep, there it is. And I note when I go there, I can now lower my own hand. I note that somebody has already raised his hand. Two people have. Graham McLean was first. So Graham, if you're able to uh, show us your face as well, that would be all the better. Um, and we'll let you have a first go. After that, I see your hand, Don, and I also saw Robert Mann waving his hand literally. Um, over to you, Graham. Uh, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Dory, very much indeed. I, I enjoyed that, and I, I'm with you as far as much of the spirit and content of what you're proposing is concerned. But I do want to quibble about your distinction between description and interpretation. Um, I think those descriptions of science on the one hand and theology on the other are fine as far as they go, but I think they're inadequate. Scientific description, though it is description, has more to it than mere description. It has an explanatory element. Scientific description, which is worth offering, is explaining something that we want to find out. Why do these things interact in the way they do? Why do these processes occur in the way that they occur? What is the origin of this or that and so on? Um, and the second thing, although that though theology is rightly described as interpretation, it also has an explanatory and a very important explanatory element. And at a certain level, it mirrors exactly what I've just been saying. It's saying, um, what is the origin of such and such? Why do things happen the way, way they do? Of course, who is in charge of the whole process and so on? But when we see that parallel between the two different kinds of uh, um, utterances being produced by science on the one hand, theology on the other, it's not so neatly a bifurcation as you've suggested to us. Both are explanatory. Now, I agree with you that they're explanatory, as you put it, from different viewpoints, and they're explanatory both, as you put it, for, as part of the comprehensive picture. That's quite right. But um, it's not so neat a division as I think you're suggesting when we get the explanatory element of each into the picture. That's my suggestion. Yeah, well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's quite useful. And uh, I hope uh, this nuance um, uh, didn't escape me or the audience. Uh, when I um, uh, defined simplistically, I think I said that twice, uh, science as a descriptive or analytical approach and uh, theology as an interpretation of reality, I was referring to reality. Reality being the most etymological of senses means things of this world. Yeah? Uh, God is not uh, a reality, etymologically speaking. Yeah? Sorry, would you tell, just say that again? I, I'm not sure that I understood that last remark. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, the curse of my uh, classical education. Uh, res, the word uh, res in, uh, in Latin, where from we have in many languages uh, reality uh, has to do with things, concrete things of this world. So I use uh, reality in this sense. Has It has to do with the universe. It has to do uh, with uh, the world, the creation. So when I said the scientific approach to reality, in other words, the universe, because science can't do and can't say anything about God, isn't it? So when I said the science is a descriptive analytical approach to reality. It's a, a, a way of saying the sciences describe phenomena that happen in the universe. And the universe means everything, including life on earth. On the other hand, I said theology 
is an interpretive approach to reality. Again, uh, when uh, theology or the spearhead of theology is turned towards reality that is the created universe. And when it deals with the created universe, theology uh, is really a hermeneutics. It deciphers uh, the mark, the signature of God in all things. You know, as Thomas Aquinas uh, uh, said in a tiny booklet, the Ente et Essentia uh, on being and essence, um, there's a signature in all things. Uh, materia signata, uh, matter is signed. Uh, matter is not only uh, organized, shaped in concrete objects, but it's also signed. It bears a signature, you know? And uh, uh, this shows that uh, a theologian would always look, or a person of faith, would always look at reality from um, the sand of a beach to uh, mountains, koalas and palm trees and kiwis and so on and so forth, uh, seeking that signature, that divine signature. That's not the description, that's an interpretation. Of course, theology is explanatory when it has to do with the mysteries of the faith. You know, For instance, when I said God is one and three, three persons uh, and, and a divine unity, that's an explanation. Of course, that's a description. But when uh, the attention, the focus of theology is on reality, in other words, uh, the exact objects that the sciences, whatever sciences explore, then theology is interpretive. Doru, thank you for that. I'm going to I'm going to stop you there, in, just in case you were going to keep going. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll give Graham a quick a quick comeback, perhaps yeah. about how well, we're defining the word reality. Thanks, Chris. Yes. Well, you you you've anticipated exactly where I'm now discomforted. Um, and I, I don't want to hog things, so I won't make a big meal of this, but that raises a whole lot of further questions to me. If you were to say to a general audience, look, the Bible isn't describing reality, I think we'd all be rather shocked, at least this part of the audience, by that suggestion. And, and we would want to say, of course, it's describing I mean, God, the, the, the sum total of what is, is first God and then what he creates. So um, we want to use reality in that sense, whatever the classicists want to say. And, and, um, and it comes back to my point that so much of what the biblic, the scriptural material and theological uh, extension of that is saying is an explanatory description of reality, including God's interactions with all that he has created. Anyway, there are no doubt further questions. I just want right. to... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just want to to uh, to uh, throw a, a line. You have thirty. You have thirty seconds, Doro. I don't need that. Uh, <laughs> the, the scriptures aren't only theology. There's a lot of culture in the scriptures. Sure. Yep. Thank you. Of uh, course. Don, over to you. You'll have to. Yep. All right. Thank. Thanks, Chris. It's more perhaps a bit of a quick comment and to uh, thank Doru. Uh, I've been obsessed for the past week, past week because I'm taking a wedding uh, at the weekend at a very swanky place. And probably a huge number of the people who are going to be there as well as the bride and groom are doctors. Most of whom have probably been through private schools but who don't believe anything. Uh, and, and in my few minutes, I'm trying to think, what can I say positively with my limited scientific background, but also with this young couple? And I'm very conscious that when we talk about uh, evolution, we're talking about also the, the theory of evolution, but there's the, also the, the origin of the whole universe, that and, and any idea of, of uh, selective change uh, really I think two different questions, but uh, I'm I'm just wondering if I can ask a quick question. Uh, how how do we deal with presenting what was said tonight? And it was wonderful to hear about the the third and fourth century Christians who were really very very 
extremely bright, I thought. How do we deal with it in everyday life? And hopefully I've got a couple of clues from tonight to share on Saturday without turning everyone away from the gospel. Thank mm. you. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we move to, to pastoral theology now. Actually, yes. uh, you know, I believe that uh, the idea of synergy or cooperation uh, is essential for the understanding of life in a Christian sense. Uh, let me give you an example from my own uh, tradition. So I'm an um, Orthodox Christian, uh, and because I already noticed that uh, a colleague of mine is present uh, who is Oriental Orthodox, I have to define myself as Eastern Orthodox to add a bit of salt and pepper. Uh, so in my Eastern Orthodox tradition, uh, in the service of, um, uh, uh, that precedes uh, the wedding ceremony, there's a, a brief introductory service, uh, like engagement service. Uh, there's a brief prayer that mentions the fact that uh, the love which uh, brought together uh, the couple is already a sign of God's blessing. And I always contemplated this, this line, this brief prayer, as the most typical uh, exemplification of the principle of synergy. So there's the natural love between the two members of the couple, but behind that love that brought them together, there's, there's God's blessing, there's go God's, uh, God's, uh, God's grace. So there you go. You can apply the principle of synergy to everything. Thank you. Thank you, Doro. Uh, Robert Mann. You had you had a question, I think, but we can't hear you at the moment. And while while you're unmuting yourself, let me remind everybody to read the comments in the in the chat. Uh, there are some interesting comments there worth reading. Go ahead, yeah. Robert. Now, two ideas that I can't agree with. The second stated and most clearly uh, is that reality is only natural, and that the term reality does not include. The supernatural and then the earlier idea which perhaps i misunderstood is that we should abandon the distinction natural versus supernatural if that was being asserted then i can't agree with that either but certainly i can't agree with the term reality excludes the supernatural it's only descriptions of the universe uh, i've never heard the term reality used that way thanks robert could i make a suggestion could I make a suggestion that we put on hold the reality question? Because I think that that's probably a, a way of using a word. And Doru has used the word in a technical classical sense, not the, uh, not the sense that uh, we're used to today. That is to say, for Christians today, uh, God is real, using mm. that word, real. Um, mm. As far as I understand it, Doro is not negating that so much as talking about the way we use the word reality. But the, let's go to the other question, given, given that we're a bit short on time. Doro, could you explain a bit more to us uh, why we need to abandon natural supernatural as a distinction and uh, how that works? Are we saying Are we saying that God and God's creation are no longer distinguished? Or what are you saying? Thank you, Chris. And this has to do with Robert's uh, points. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have never said that the distinction is out of the question. On the contrary, yeah? the distinction should be there because, because God is present and actively present throughout the whole continuum of the creation. Yeah? So the distinction is there. What I say is we should do away with the separation, which is a very different topic. Distinction is that's God uncreated. That's the created reality. But we never separate them. And, and the examples I have given you, especially the second one uh, from Basil, uh, with uh, God's uh, energy at work uh, uh, in the maternal womb of the creation, that shows that the supernatural is present within the natural. My problem is that as long as we continue to function in the Western paradigm of separating the natural from the supernatural, in other words, uh, as long as we conceive of 
uh, uh, the natural as deprived of uh, the supernatural's presence, we have a big problem, which is the problem that we experience in, uh, in at least oh, uh, three, four hundred uh, 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 years. Yeah? Uh, we have experienced it and it's, it's the outcome of a separation that um, uh, leads to a logic of either or. It's either natural or the supernatural. So could I, could I just try and ask a question, but I just want a yes or no answer to this one, Doric. So are you saying that if we separate the natural and the supernatural totally, we finish up being deists instead of theists? Yeah, something like that. Thank you. Sorry for the three <laughs> words instead of one. Antonius, your turn. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to emphasize, I think, what Doro is saying. Historically, I think you can only have atheists when you separate the natural from the supernatural. As I understand the history, before that separation happens, um, atheism is simply impossible. And it only becomes possible when you pull the two apart. And now, suddenly, you can cancel one of them out and, and just leave the na nature without God. That, that's pretty much what uh, what I keep saying. And as long as uh, we, we function uh, with the separation of uh, the natural from the supernatural, in other words, um, we uh, believe in uh, what the scholastics called natura pura, pure nature, uh, untainted by the supernatural, uh, the problems that we, uh, we face with uh, uh, the conflict between various ideologies, uh, such as creationism and evolutionism, cannot be um, uh, avoided. Mm. Well, I must say this is very interesting. Who else would like to ask a question? Or in the absence of a question, a brief comment. Ian, you've made a comment in the chat there about uh, inference. Why don't you just expand on that? Tell us why you're uh, enthusiastic about that phrase. Uh, well, not so much inference. I was, uh, that's capital letters, but really the emphasis was more on Basil saying that the uh, uh, remarks in the opening of Genesis were left things out so that the mind can exercise its skills by doing some inferring. Uh, and I think we do so need to exercise the skills of our minds. Some people lock themselves very heavily into the text without doing much inferring and without doing much referring back to the text. Um, I also couldn't avoid going on to make a little dig at uh, seeing how he'd preempted a little bit of process theology on the way. And talking about latent potentiality, I think that's pretty good process stuff. Very true. I mean, th that's, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, his physics, in other words, his idea of nature um, uh, was indebted to um, Aristotle, where uh, there was this uh, duality of uh, potentiality and actuality, uh, things that promise to be and things that actually become. Uh, what they promised to be. And uh, for uh, Basil and many uh, others in the fourth century, fifth century, and even later, uh, this was pretty much the norm. They believed uh, in uh, a creation that develops. It's not just a matter of uh, bringing in some, theology, some uh, scientific information in order to fill the gaps in the theological narrative of Genesis. Uh, it is also a way of uh, looking at uh, uh, the universe, uh, life on earth, uh, through the lens, uh, the descriptive lens, explanatory lens of the available sciences and seeing there, as you said, processes uh, occurring. Really, I, I could bring you, I, I wanted to give you uh, a classical author, one of the most respected in, in, in the early Christianity, in the early Christian centuries. But I, I could have given you uh, plenty other examples uh, where the idea of a process is very emphatic. For instance, Basil is uh, less interested in exploring that path, but his 
uh, younger brother, Gregory of Nyssa, uh, he was very strong in, in the idea of processes in nature, processes, changes, transformations, and so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, the book that I, I presented the, the, cover, uh, the cover earlier uh, deals uh, a lot with, with this kind of stuff. Hmm. Uh, John Modra, I see that hand. Yeah, look, uh, I just wondered whether, Don, you'd actually read any of uh, Alfred North Whitehead. And his criticism seems to align with yours about the fact that the West is is a little bit lost in its own pedantry. I mean, he, he used the term and became quite popular in educational circles in the 20s about mere description and the fact that it would lead to uh, misplaced concreteness, which is so true of my work. And it seems to be that West is actually struggling to make good conclusions. So there's some quite deep potential for discussion, I feel, in what you're saying. That, for example, in my work, I, I accept that evolution occurs, but I don't make the silly assumption that it describes everything that's ever happened, no. which Thank seems to me what creation we do all, all of us do. We say God, well, God's place is there, but we don't always understand uh, his, well, simple, the simple problems with the first chapter of Genesis are there. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I haven't read uh, directly Whitehead. I read about, uh -huh. not directly. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm aware from secondary sources of what we say, uh, what you say, and, and, uh, and yes, the, it's roughly the same kind of idea. And closer to us, uh, um, uh, our colleague uh, in ISCAST, um, uh, Peter Harrison, uh, wrote that book, um, uh, The Territories of, uh, of Science and Religion, uh, mm -hmm. where he actually uh, hints at the same kind of approach and solution that uh, at least traditional Christianity uh, was never about dissociating so sharply what's the business of science, what's the business yeah. of uh, of theology. And of course, uh, we should avoid any kind of uh, uh, syncretism and uh, stupid uh, confirmisms yeah. and stuff like that. But the idea is there that we should look at things and we should start from now to look at things from a very different angle. Uh, my choice is to discuss about the principle of synergy. Uh, and I believe that, that that's uh, a very good um, uh, way of handling uh, various matters. And I, actually, I have recently tested uh, my proposal, uh, a bit more developed that, uh, than what I presented tonight, uh, in, in conversations with a friend who is a, 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 an atheist astrophysicist. Ah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I won't disclose uh, his name, but we discussed this. And, and as, uh, uh, actually, we write together a paper, if you can imagine that. And I, I, uh, I presented this, this, uh, this uh, proposal and he said, look, this isn't bad at all, you know, I have to think about. Uh, th that's a game changer for me. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, I, I got a book out of the libraries of uh, Carlton that was thrown away because it presented a survey of scientists and said, proposed that most scientists are not uh, uh, atheists, they're agnostic. Yeah. At least, at the very least. And, and, and that's one of the, uh, another thing that, that uh, uh, sort of uh, began to interest me in the last uh, couple of years. And I actually, I, uh, I, I wrote something about it. Uh, as long as they are uh, able to draw a line between uh, what's true science and ideological convictions, yeah. sky's the limit. They can be whatever they want. And uh, you know, the uh, uh, Capra, you know, uh, Buddhist or whatever he is, Confucianist or whatever he is, um, or Taoist, uh, uh, David Bohm, Buddhist, and so on and so forth. So many other examples. They have embraced uh, uh, spiritualities or religious philosophies that somehow, from their viewpoint, give a good interpretation to what the sciences describe, analyze, explain as phenomena, you know? Yeah. Uh, it it, uh, it uh, befalls to us Christians of our day and age to do something similar. Why uh, they need to to go to Buddhism and Taoism and Islam in order to describe uh, the reality that our sciences um, uh, analyze? 
Well, for me as a Christian, uh, not admitting I don't know everything means uh, it's a great freedom. Whereas those who presume to know how it all started and why it all works this way, there's a limitation. You know, Christians traditionally sing. This is creation. We can see it. It's wonderful. How does it work? Well, we only have part, have a part we know, don't we? And I need to draw us to a close. Sure. I, I, I know you just took a breath then, John, but... Oh, good. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I'm switching uh, myself off. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Doru. Uh, it's been very stimulating. We, As usual, we could go on talking about these things for a long time, but we're going to be um, faithful to our promise about time. Uh, I'd like to invite Ian. I've already invited Ian, and he's agreed uh, to close with a prayer. Thanks very much, Ian. Thank you. Uh, God, we give you thanks for our minds being stretched tonight. We ask you to help us as we think through these things and uh, uh, make good use of inferring knowledge from what you provide. Guide us by your spirit. Help us in our daily living and bless Doru as he continues his work. Thank you for him and thank you for his presentation. We ask you these things and we give you this thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.